campaigns and competitions are quite interesting because they tend to be carried out in real, real time and are reactions to various difficulties in the food supply situation as and when they arise. The magazines I've looked at are Home Chat, Woman's Life and Home Journal. I'm going to hereafter refer that to that as Woman's Life. Um, food was a very pervasive theme in the magazines. It came through in every single type of article. It's in the stories. You, there's short stories like um, Love in the Margarine Queue or <laughs> Love Over a Cup of Sugar. Um, and it's folk, they tended to talk about it in just every little aspect. So when Hilda M. Love, who was a regular contributor to Home Chat, wrote in, of a dinner party in 1917, she, thought, she wrote, they talked of food, of course, who doesn't in these days. The food supply situation challenged the Edwardian notion of a good diet. Now, this is a good diet as was understood by the middle classes. So bacon, butter, eggs, lots of fresh meat, cakes, afternoon tea, tea, coffee, that sort of thing. Um, I'm not going to go into a serious discussion of class because that would take up most of the paper. But for the purposes of this, I'm going to just ask you to operate under the, um, or take my word for it, that a lot of these magazines tended to present a middle class view of society. Whether or not readers were working class or middle class is irrelevant. A lot of the themes there in them were middle class. Um, by the early 20th century, Britain relied on the importation of food. Approximately 60% of all food consumed did not originate here. A significant portion of eggs and butter, for example, came from De Denmark, and a third of the wheat came from Russia through the Dardanelles. Um, and when the sea, when the sea, trades, she, sea trade routes closed up, this became a lot more difficult to obtain your butter and your eggs, and people were asked to you know, substitute. What can you substitute for butter? Margarine or eggs or egg powder became popular. And there's a lot of advertisements for these in the magazines. Um, and the food requirements of the armed forces increased exponentially and further reduced the amount of food available for the consumption on the home front. Home chat at one point also suggested that the increased number of women in the workforce also strained the food supply because they now required more food that they were no longer living sedentary lives. Food themed campaigns and competitions were a way to keep morale up on the home front and to keep women thinking about food economy, even if they didn't enter the competitions or subscribe to the campaign campaigns themselves. Ken Albala wrote of recipes that sometimes what seems to be a simple list actually contains an explicit agenda with social, political and economic goals. With this in mind, this paper will discuss one campaign, the Milk for Tommy's Tea Fund, and two competitions, Green Peas for Tommy and Cakes by Post. And it will show how such campaigns and competitions were used by magazines to unite women into a kitchen army. Just a bit on the magazines themselves. Um, magazines were a source of information for women and were a means of mass communication between them. Um, they were a public space where women could share and debate ideas. The introduction of compulsory education ensured that and the population was increasingly literate, about 90% by 1900. And there was a growing demand for quick and informal reading material. The growth of the railway, for, exa railway, for example, also, demanded, also created a demand for ephemeral half-hour reading material, as did women in the workforce. The magazines were small. They were small in size and small in length, and you could read them on your tea break, your lunch break, your morning or evening commute. Women were becoming the largest consumers of this new journal journalism and there was an explosion in titles aimed directly at women. It was estimated that by 1914, there were approximately 50 titles on the market, specifically for women, most of them relatively short-lived. There were therefore many titles I could have chosen for this study. However, I chose these three, um, and I would have a slide with them here now, um, because they lasted a long time. Two of them, Woman's Life and Home Chat, both came out at varying points in 1895, Home Chat lasted to the 1950s. Woman's Life, you can still buy in the form of Woman's Own today. And Home Cookery, which was a specialist periodical, uh, came out in 1896 and lasted to the 1920s. Home Chat and Woman's Life were direct competitors for each other. And 
and they were also they were also competing with Home Notes, which was considered one of the first women's magazines and had been introduced in 1894. Home Cookery was the cookery magazine of Home Notes. So they're all three are competing with each other for the same market. Um, in terms of reading uh, readership figures, the Advertisers Protection, so Advertisers Protection Society monthly circular recorded that in the first six months of 1914, Home Chat had a circulation of 278,468. Woman's Life had a similar figure at 200,000. I can't find any, any circulation figures for home cookery prior to the war. However, it, for, it first appeared in the monthly circular in 1919, by which stage home, cha home chat and woman's life had been removed, and home cookery at this point had a circulation of 40,000. This is particularly interesting when the two general weeklies had been removed and home chat had clearly grown in importance during the war. Um, I'm going to read off my slides because you can't see them. Before I talk about the specific war campaigns and competitions, I want to briefly mention the ongoing hints competitions that were run by all three magazines before and during the war. Readers were encouraged to send in hints to magazines and the best would be printed and receive a prize. This helped the magazine to generate a form of interactive content, which has been argued that is not dissimilar to interactive internet participation in competitions or television competitions. Um, Titbits, which was a magazine which came out in the, 18, in the 1880s, championed this sort of interactive, competitive participation. And readers were invited to submit entries which would become magazine copies. So the Titbits Villa campaign for competition, readers, uh, a reader won a villa in South London for submitting a 10,000 word story. Um, hence, competitions allowed the creators of the periodicals to keep abreast of the concerns of their readers as the hints and tips would change as the social conditions facing readers changed. Women were encouraged to help each other to manage the conditions of wartime by sharing information using the magazines as a medium. And I have an advertisement for a home chat competition here, which was 50 half crowns for postcards. All over the kingdom, home chat readers are taking care of the pence as some of them never did before in their lives. Anybody who discovers a, a way of making a little of anything go a long way and who tells other people about it is fighting Great Britain's war in the British housekeeper's way. I want a wide range of economies, not only cookery ones, any sort of economy that seems to you penny wise and not pound foolish. It was mostly um, the food ones that, that won and were printed. Um, in June 1917, Woman's Life published an article entitled To Help You Housekeeping, which it admitted was created from reader hints. Again, it was mostly recipes and contained a recipe for a war cake made from war flour and using butter, margarine as a butter substitute and egg powder and a pretty savoury, which was cheese straws with anchovy cream and beetroot. Pretty and dainty tended to be the kind of hints they liked. Anything that kept with this notion of femininity and that kept uh, reinforcing this. At the end of the article, readers were reminded that this was an ongoing competition and that prizes were given for each hint. They continually emphasised that every hint you send in won a prize. Not all the prizes were mon monetary. You could get an umbrella. I've seen um, prizes offered as uh, jams, marmalades, cakes. They also gave you cookbooks. The Win the War cookbook was also one prize. Um, and quite a lot of the prize winning hints were ingenious ways to deal with food shortages. Um, frying bread in bacon fat, for example, was a winning prize, which was a suggested alternative to rashers. And you could add a pinch of mustard to ground coffee before adding boiling water, which reduced the amount of coffee needed. Yeah, it doesn't sound nice. And I decided not to give more of the horrible ones before lunch. Um, they all, margarine, I don't eat margarine myself or butter for that matter, but margarine apparently has a very distinctive taste and if you're used to eating butter, um, the taste is apparently not pleasant. So they suggested ways of making margarine taste much nicer. So I have a tip here, which was for making margarine better. So I now use all my mutton dripping or cakes for cakes and pastry but I don't use it as the flavour is strong in this case, uh, so strong in this case. So you beat it to a cream, add a little bit of carbonate of soda and lemon juice and stir it in well before using. If this is done, there is no unpleasant taste, more especially if one uses half of this and half a weight of nut butter. 
So I can't really imagine that being very nice in a cake, but this is seriously what they suggested you do. Now, I'm gonna go on to milk for Tommy's tea. This was a campaign instituted very, very early in the war in November 1914. And it was a reaction to reports that the British army wasn't providing milk for its soldiers in their tea. It drew on one of the traditional roles of women, which was to pour tea at the table, which still exists somewhat in the phrase, I'll be mother when pouring tea. And I have a quote here. There must be thousands of English women in English drawing rooms, downstairs in English kitchens, who feel exactly as we do. Feel they'd like to be able to pour out a nice cup of tea and pass it from their own tea table straight to a thirsty soldier. On the 28th of November 1914, Home Chat announced that it was establishing a milk fund, which is similar to a comfort fund, so that Tommy would be able to have milk in his tea, as the conditions of war caused soldiers, and I quote, to regard milk in their tea as a very special treat. In British tradition, milky sugary tea is considered the norm, whereas Russia and France, people, uh, at least the periodicals told, tell me so, were considered to, to just drink it black and with lemon. Another quote about the state of tea, it's fairly worried me to think a lot of that, think of a lot of our fellows like our Jim coming up wet and cold and tired out and dying for a cup of tea to hearten them, having to gulp down stuff that's as strong as gunpowder, as bitter as vinegar, because there's no milk to be got. Tea consumption had increased in Britain during the 19th century, and as P. Matthias has shown, the consumption of black tea from India as opposed to green tea imported from China with added milk became common from the mid-1870s. At the same time, there was a rise in consumption of tinned milk. The Anglo-Swiss Condensed Milk Company had begun importation of tinned milk to Britain from the 1860s, and the levels of imported milk increased with the arrival of Nestle to the market in the 1870s. Tinned milk was popular because it reduced the risk of adulteration that came with using fresh milk. Milk often traveled long distances, particularly to urban areas, and quite often it could spoil, go sour. There was a lot of um, preservatives in it. Tinned milk was also a lot cheaper, and it was sweet, so you didn't have to buy sugar if you wanted to have sweet sugary tea. Homesickness, according to Home Chat, was a hankering for a nice hot cup of fresh strong tea with sugar and plenty of milk in it. And anyone who's ever wanted a cup of tea when they're really traveling home knows exactly what that feels like. The British Army, however, was not concerned really with the personal tastes of its charges. Soldiers got their tea, but often they didn't get milk. Home Chat reassured readers that their campaign for the Milk for Tommy's Tea Front had received the full support of the War Office. Readers were asked to contribute six pence or a shilling, and Home Chat would purchase tins of condensed milk in bulk from a British supplier, the Anglo-Swiss Milk Company, which was actually Nestle and not all that British. Nestle had purchased the Anglo-Swiss Milk Company in 1905, but this wasn't revealed in Home Chat till much, much later, several years in fact. Um, these tins had a special label which read, across this foam from hearts at home, there rings a word of cheer. We send today our gift and say, God bless you, Tommy dear. The success of this scheme with over 40,000 half pounds of condensed milk sent to the front in a six month period through home chat attracted the attention of Sir John French, the army chief of staff. And home chat published the letter and informed readers that they should be proud of something that you did in connection with the war. Um, I also have, you could buy a copy of the I had a nice image of it. You could buy a copy of this letter on art paper. They boarded, they had it really nicely boarded with a flag. And you could buy this and put it on your wall as a constant reminder of something that you did. And um, this is how you supported the war. You couldn't, if you couldn't work in munitions factories or you didn't have that much money, you could at least send them milk in the trenches. Um, the advertising for this campaign began to dwindle in March 1915, and by June it had disappeared completely. Subsequently, Nestle began advertising its own tins of Nestle milk campaign, which was very, very similar to this the milk for Tommy's tea, except you didn't place your subscriptions through home chat. You did it through your grocer and directly with Nestle, and they had their own British Expeditionary Force Department at, that, um, at their depot in Farringdon. Um, right, the second, comp this time sort of a campaign competition border, um, Green Peas for Tommy. This competition ran between March and August 1915 and was announced in an article entitled Why We Ask for a Corner of Your Garden. Readers were told that here's another little thing that we, 
editors, staff and readers of Home Chat can do for the men who are risking their lives for us on land, on sea and under the sea and in the air. We can grow peas for them. Um, interested readers were invited to send off for seeds, which they would then grow. They were then to sell, sell their, send their 12 best pea pods in for judging. The timing of the competition in March 1915 was roughly a month after fears began to circulate that Germany was making an attempt at unrestricted submarine warfare, which raised concerns regarding Britain's small supply of domestic produce. The comp this competition drew on the wider calls for the home front population to grow their own food and was an early attempt to get civilians into the habit of kitchen gardens. The periodicals encourage readers to cultivate their own private gardens, along with articles on the best methods for growing these vegetables, discussions of mistakes often seen on the allotments. It was estimated that by May 1917 there were around 500,000 vegetable plots. If people were to grow their own food, it would reduce reliance on imported foodstuffs and reduce the calls for the government to intervene in the food supply situation, something which they were reluctant to do, as Karen has shown. Allotments also began to allow a different form of socialising. The magazines began to frequently mention tea on the allotment as a common occurrence, and dinner parties using homegrown products were discussed in articles, such as appeasing allotment appetites. However, this competition required access to a patch of land to grow peas, which more than likely precluded a lot of urban readers from entering. There are other suggestions for similar competitions in women's life, such as growing herbs and other sort of pot crops that you don't need a large area to grow in or even you just need a windowsill. Herbs are also suggested as a way for women to make additional income from their kitchen garden. You could sell them to your less enterprising neighbours. Home Chat revealed that they had received upwards of 500 entries, viable entries that is, but the prizes were quite a secondary part of the scheme. No one seemed to care much whether they won or not, if only Tommy got his peas somehow. Um, there were 20 winners of five shillings each and all the peas went to various hospitals such as St. Dun Dunstan's Hospitals for the Blind, the London Hospital, St. Bartholomew's and Chelsea Hospital. I was also very interested to see at the back the um, posters the, from the children about Grow Your Own. Both Milk for Tommy's Tea and the Green Peas were very heavily promoted in the children's pages. And in fact, two of the winners for, of the Green Pea competition were nine years old. Um, okay. The last competition I want to explore was a cake competition run by Home Cookery between November 1915 January 1916. It was sort of a bake-off through the post. <laughs> Care packages were, to the soldiers were widely encouraged, not least because it helped to prop up the morale of soldiers and provided them items that the army didn't. Um, Rachel Duffett has explored the emotional significance of food for serving soldiers and has showed that more attention was paid to nutritional values rather than the comfort of soldiers. What to put in these parcels was frequently mentioned, as was the sort of edible that would survive the post. Home chat suggested butterscotch, for example, or other hard sweets that you could put in a tin and they're going to be fresh no matter how long it took. Home Cookery explained that it was running this competition because one hears of sad tales, sometimes of broken boxes of stale crumbs which arrive at their destination. And it isn't the fault of the post office either, because all cakes are not suitable for sending through the post. This competition was, this was a competition to find the best cake recipe that would survive the post and make use of the available ingredients. The time between posting and judging was intended to mimic the time it would take cakes to reach the Western Front. There were 12 winners and the two best received prizes of 10 shillings and the recipes were printed. Home cookery also placed an emphasis on the patriotic implications of the, this competition. Taking part was for the benefit of soldiers, not winning, and stated that even those readers who have not succeeded in winning a prize will, I feel sure, be happy to know that their cakes have brought pleasure to hundreds of our soldiers. Christmas puddings were also mentioned every November of the, of the war as being something that soldiers who could not make it home for Christmas most looked forward to. And Christmas puddings are normally prepared in November anyway, so you could prepare them in November, send them to the front, and they would still reach them in fairly fine condition. I have a great slide of... Um, <laughs> Why I'm, an article called Why I'm Off to the Front by a Plum Pudding. It's... <laughs> anyway. Um, campaigns and competitions such as those touched upon in this paper provided women with a light but meaningful way to engage with the war effort. Alongside the calls for patriotic economy and food, 
These magazines allowed women to be heroes at home, while winning prizes or joining in a mass campaign to ensure that serving soldiers had comforts that they would not have got through the army. I hope that this paper has shown that in economic and political terms, food-themed campaigns and competitions formed part of the wider war campaign and were reactions to particular occurrences and incidences in the prosecution of war. Thank you.